and welcome everybody to this seminar. We're doing um, data protection for charities um, today. My name is Vicky Bowles and I'm a partner in our commercial team, but I specialise in all things information law related. So data protection is obviously a big part of that, but I also do FOI, EIR, privacy um, and th all those kinds of um, issues as well. But today we're focusing on data protection. So I'm going to run through what makes a compliant charity. Um, so some headlines of things to go away and hopefully um, think about. Um, I'm then going to talk about using photographs and videos and what you need to know. Um, the reason I picked that is because I've had um, quite a few questions on that very issue just recently, and um, a lot of them are coming from charities. So I thought it was worth just having a little update on um, what you need to do if you want to use photographs and videos or images generally. Um, I'm then going to talk very briefly about the latest on the reforms. Um, you may or may not be aware that there's a data reform bill um, that's being proposed. So I'll just talk about a couple of the, um, the proposals there that might be of interest. Um, and then I'm hoping to leave about uh, 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. So yeah, if you do have any questions, if you pop them in the Q&A box, and at the end, I will go through them and try and answer as many as I can. If I can't answer them all, um, actually live, then I will be sure to answer them in the follow up afterwards. That's OK. So um, what oh, text heading? What does the compliant charity look like? That's good. That uh, shows my editing skills aren't as good as they should be. So what does a compliant charity look like? And essentially, a compliant charity will be able to show three things. They'll be able to show that they have an understanding of the law. Um, you will be able to evidence that you can comply with the law and you will have a culture of compliance. Um, understanding of the law, um, that's that's the first step. And actually, ironically, that's the easiest bit. So you need to understand what your obligations are and what you need to do. Um, evidencing compliance, the second stage, is the bit that most people forget. And it's actually quite important because the UK GDPR, um, as the GDPR did before it, says that it's not only enough to be compliant, you actually have to be able to demonstrate you are compliant. So you actually have to be able to um, show that that's the case. Um, I've just seen a question, if any of your points don't apply to Scotland, could you identify and define the variation? Absolutely, um, nothing that I say will not apply in Scotland because the UK GDPR applies equally to Scotland as it does to England and Wales. So, and that's all I'm focusing on today. So everything should be um, actually as it, um, as it will apply in Scotland, as it would apply in England and Wales, so it should be across the board. Um, so evidence in compliance, so you not only have to be compliant, you have to be able to demonstrate and show and evidence that you are compliant, and that's part of the accountability principle. So that is actually set out in law, so it is a legal requirement that you demonstrate compliance. And the final piece of the jigsaw, um, the ICO particularly likes to talk about having a culture of compliance. And that's the bit that's actually quite tricky to demonstrate and it's tricky to, um, to show actually, um, and how do you build a culture of compliance? Um, and it, But that, that comes from, um, what I think what the ICO is getting at is that everybody in your organization that deals with data understands what their particular obligations are. They don't need to be a specialist in data protection law. They just need to understand what they need to do day to day to do their job how do they protect the information that they are protecting and you you do that by making sure that individuals who deal with personal information are trained and they're trained regularly the ICO is very keen on that um, but also that um, there is a there's a culture of people for example reporting breaches um, and it's something that we see quite a lot. Um, breaches happen. Um, we are all human beings and we all make mistakes. Um, and even lawyers make mistakes, shockingly enough. So um, it, breaches will happen and they will happen in all organisations, in all sectors and at all levels. But it's really important that those breaches are um, notified to the right people and logged so that if there is a pattern of behaviour or there's a particular issue in a particular department because there's something not quite right with the software, you can identify that and 
take steps to address it. If you don't know where the breaches are, you can't do that. And that's a key part of one of your obligations to make sure that you've got appropriate technical and organisational measures in place. Um, so a culture of compliance is not just about how, you, how the individual protects their information, but also those individuals are happy that they can report breaches. They understand what subject access requests are so that they know that if they have one, who to send it to you and all those kinds of things. Um, and I can talk to you in very generic terms about how it needs to be a top down and all that awful management speak. Um, but essentially, it is about making sure that everyone in your organisation that deals with personal data is on board with you um, as the leaders of your organisation and that everybody understands that this is important and needs to be taken seriously. So key factors in compliance. Um, I should say that in the course of the next two slides, um, the things I'm going to talk about, I could probably do an hour seminar on each section. So I'm really trying to sort of just focus in on the key areas. And then if you want any more information about any of the specific areas, um, do please you know, come back after the session. So um, key factors in compliance. The first one, and this is um, to, in my opinion, the most important one. Um, you can't be a compliant charity unless you know what personal data you have, where it is at all times, and why you have it. Um, and this, if you have an Article 30 record, this is essentially what that is, or a record of processing activities, a data map, a data flow, a data audit, whatever you've called it. It's a spreadsheet, essentially, that lists all the types of information that you hold about people. So what types of people are they? your trustees, uh, your staff, your beneficiaries, um, whoever it is, your volunteers. Um, what type of individual are they to you? Um, what information do you have about them? Do you have their contact details? Um, for staff, you'll have all sorts of information about pay and about um, sickness and all those sorts of things. Um, so what information do you have? And where it is at all times, and by that I mean um, it comes into you from usually from the individual or wherever you're collecting your information, and then you store it somewhere on your system. So where is it stored? Do you have a separate HR system? Do you have software that you use? You know, if you use uh, at um, BWB, we use um, a Microsoft system. So all of our personal data is with Microsoft at one point or another. As soon as you email me, it's in an outlook. So Microsoft have access to that. So where is it? And not just where is it in terms of what software is it on, where in the world is it when it's in that software? Now, I can't tell you exactly where my emails, my outlook is, but I know that Microsoft store it on a server that is somewhere in the world, but I don't know exactly where it is. I don't think Microsoft, to be fair, actually know exactly where it is. I guess someone must do, um, but I know it's stored somewhere in the world. And because I know it could be stored outside of the UK, I know then that I need to have in place a safeguard so I can make sure that that safeguard is in place. Now, Microsoft have those safeguards in place, as you might imagine, so we can tick that box and it's all relatively um, simple. Um, but it's really important um, if you are using um, software applications that you do know where that information is stored and they should be telling you where they store their information and if they store it outside of the UK, what safeguard they are relying on. So that's not to say that you can't store information outside of the UK, you absolutely can. You just need to make sure that the right contracts or whatever it is are in place. And the final piece of that, that particular jigsaw, um, is why you have the information. Um, and again, that's really crucial. So um, first of all, it will tell you whether you need it or not. And that's actually quite a helpful exercise to do. Many of you will have done it back in 2016 or 2018 when the Act, uh, the GDPR first came in. Um, but it's important that you keep that up to date because things change and you do new things, you take on new projects. So why do you have that information? Um, so as I said, first of all, um, you'll realise that you might be collecting information that you don't need. So you can stop collecting it and that frees up space on your servers, etc., which is always good. Um, so why you have the information? 
also tells you what legal basis you're relying on and that's important when it comes to privacy notices now i'm not talking in the in any detail about that today um, but actually if you know why you hold information and what you're likely to do with it that can be really helpful in terms of as i said notify identifying legal basis and understanding as well um, what what data you want because you that this process can also identify actually we could do with knowing this piece of information and we don't so let's ask for it let's collect it in whatever way you want to collect it so <clears throat> that's your your starting point what you have where it is at all times and um, why you have it and then the other elements of ensuring compliance involve having the right policies and procedures in place now, policies I can talk to you about for days, probably. Um, I mentioned privacy notices. There's also retention policies, um, breach registers, um, Article 30 records, if you're required to have them, um, and other general policies that are helpful. So some organisations will have a policy on um, photographs and videos, for example. It's not a legal requirement, but it can be helpful if you're using a lot of them to have, have things written down. Um, with all policies and procedures, um, my advice is always to make them specific to your organisation. So it's great if you can buy a generic template, and obviously we have templates um, that we've created, but what we've tried to do here is make them more sector specific. Um, so that actually it's not just a generic, say, so data protection policy is a good example, and I quite often get asked for one of these. And um, my question to the client is always, what is the purpose of this policy? Why do you want one? Um, because a generic data protection policy will just say, these are the data protection principles um, and this is how we comply with them. And that's not necessarily actually that helpful. What would be more helpful is perhaps a data protection policy for staff that says, these are the things that you specifically need to do, uh, volunteers as well, in your role in order to ensure that we comply. So you don't even need to necessarily talk about data protection principles or the law. It's the practical side of what people need to know. Um, information security policies as well can be quite useful for that. So things like what kind of, um, how do you uh, decide what a strong password is? What sort of password do you want people who have access to your systems to use? You can put that in a policy. Um, other things you can put in there around um, what to do if an individual wants to share information, which which types of sharing are just permitted and which do they need to get permission for? Um, can you use um, portable USB devices? What happens if you're working from home? All of those sorts of questions. So we all suffer from policy overload and particularly I think in the charity sector where you're so heavily regulated, there are so many policies that you have to have. It's really important to pick those that actually do add value and make sense for you to have. Um, but also with data protection particularly, because you've got this additional requirement to demonstrate compliance, but having policies and procedures is just a really easy way of doing it. Um, one example, um, you're required to have a data breach register, so you're required to have some sort of, again, it's usually a spreadsheet that just sets out um, all the data breaches you've experienced. So not just the ones you report, also all the minor ones that happen, so the email that goes astray or whatever it is. Um, it added to that, if you're a large enough organisation, you can have a data protection, a data breach um, procedure. So who does it get reported to? Who investigates? And what happens um, once the key bit really for the ICO actually is what happens at the end of the breach. So a breach happens and you investigate why it's happened. Then what do you do if you just log it in the register and don't ever look at it again? There's no point in having the register. You actually need to learn from these things. And if there is something you can do in future to prevent it happening, how does that then get put into place? So that is a useful um, document, it doesn't need to be very long, um, but helps you demonstrate that you are compliant because you've got a procedure in place for this sort of reporting. So that's your policies and your procedures and your documents. The next useful um, piece, uh, of the um, compliance, I keep saying jigsaw, sorry, I'm obviously on a jigsaw um, analogy today, uh, respect for individual rights. 
so not just subject access, but also the right to erasure, the right to replication, the right to object, etc. Um, you need to be able to show that you are set up to deal with these things. Now, some of you listening today will have had lots of experience, unfortunately, and some of you will have had none. Um, and it's not always the case that these, um, these types of things are easy to deal with, and they're not always um, particularly um, straightforward. Um, some of them can be very, very large and very complex. Um, however, um, you need to be able to show that actually you can deal with these things and you're willing to deal with these, these things. They are a right, so individuals have a legal right to make these requests. Um, so how can you demonstrate? Again, a piece of paper with a process can be useful. I'm slightly less keen on those um, for subject access requests because they tend to be a bit too uh, formulaic and it, it can make it look like you go through a process rather than dealing with them on a case by case basis, so you have to be quite careful about that, but um, but having a mechanism for people to be able to exercise those rights is important and being able to recognise them and, and show that you deal with them is important. Um, Understanding data sharing. Um, so I talked just now about you need to know where your data is at all times, and so not just in terms of physically where in the world is it, but also where is information shared on a regular basis and who is it shared with? Um, and once you know that, then you know, well, actually, do I need a particular agreement? So very, very briefly, because again, this is the topic that I could go into in so much more detail. Um, there are three types of data sharing um, for personal data. There's controller to controller sharing. So when you share information about employees with HMRC, that is controller to controller sharing because you have the information in order to do what you need to do as, uh, as with your employees. HMRC have it for their own purposes. Um, so they're using it for whatever they're using it for. It's two separate purposes. You're two separate controllers and you're sharing the information. There's joint, and you don't need an agreement in place for that. So it's really important if it's controller to controller, there is no requirement for an agreement. There's no requirement. Some cases you will want to have an agreement in place um, because it's appropriate, because it's helpful, um, because it's the NHS and they are telling you you have to. Um, so in some cases you will, but it's not a legal requirement. So you don't have to have an agreement in place with everybody when you share personal data. If it's controller to controller, you only have an agreement if it's appropriate in the circumstances. Joint controllers are where you are working with an organization and you are jointly um, using the information essentially. So you're making decisions together about what information you collect and what you're going to do with it. So the usual example is some sort of joint event. Um, or sometimes if you are offering I've done a couple of agreements recently where um, organisations offer um, placements to university students as part of their course. Um, and there are certain um, requirements that, that the student has to, to do in order to pass this particular element. So it's not just work experience, there's some, some elements of formal learning there. Um, and in some, for some bits of information there, you will be joint data controllers because you'll be working with the university, with your partner, on that piece of information. If you are joint data controllers, you do have to have an agreement in place, but it only has to say um, essentially who is responsible for privacy notice information, who's responsible for information rights, and you can just be responsible for your own if that's easier, but you need to put that agreement, um, or you can nominate one or other of you. Um, and um, you have to tell people about it. So it's important that you know where those joint controller relationships are because you've got an obligation to tell individuals about them. So there's controller to controller sharing, no agreement needed, joint controller sharing, very brief agreement needed. Um, and the final one is um, controller to processor. So I gave the example of Microsoft earlier, and I like that example because it's nice and simple. Um, Microsoft are a data processor. Um, for all of the organizations when you use them. Um, so any kind of operating system is a data processor because they have access to your personal data because you're putting it into Outlook or Excel or Word or whatever it is you're doing. Um, so they are storing that for you. They have 
um, although it might be encrypted and it might be secure and all of those things, but they do have potentially access to personal data. So they are a processor of yours. Um, and that means they can't do anything with the information other than what they are set up to do. So you have told them, so I want to use Excel because I want to make spreadsheets. Um, they can only use the information that you're giving them for the purpose of presenting that spreadsheet. They can't take it and use it for their own purposes. Um, so they are a data processor because they have no control over the information that you are providing to them. Um, and in that circumstance, you do have to have a, a legally enforceable agreement in place, which is usually a contract. But if it is a contract, there has to be some considerations, there has to be some sort of payment mechanism or some sort of deed if there is no payment. Um, so it has to be legally enforceable um, agreement between you and it has to contain specific clauses. Um, these are set out in Article 28 of the UK GDPR and they are relatively lengthy. Um, the shortest data processing agreement I've ever drafted, I think, was three pages, and that really was bare bones. Um, so it's not, um, you should have a relatively, um, I suppose three pages isn't huge in the grand scheme of things, but um, I think it's quite long. Um, so they, uh, there should be some fairly hefty clauses in place um, as between you. Um, Microsoft do have a, uh, um, a data processing agreement in place. You may not know it, but if you use them, you've signed up to it. Apple have one. Theirs is very difficult to find, but they do have one. Um, who else have I checked? People like um, Sage Accounting. Uh, they will be, um, their software is a data processor of yours. They have a compliant agreement in place. Um, so lots of big organizations do have them, um, but do be aware that some don't. Um, it's not usually an issue actually until you are um, looking to merge and somebody's doing some due diligence on you or something goes wrong. Um, so you tend to take a risk based approach in those circumstances. But under the law, if you're going to be a 100% compliant charity, all of your data processor agreements would be properly formulated and have all the clauses in them. I do understand that's not practical in all cases, but where you can, you should be looking at making sure those clauses are in there. The next part of compliance, um, making sure that all data is secured, no matter where it is. Um, so you have an obligation to put in place appropriate technical and organizational measures. Um, in fact, I spoke for an hour and a half on appropriate technical and organizational measures um, a couple of weeks ago, so I won't go into that. But what that means is um, you have in place measures to protect data uh, that are proportionate to the type of data it is. So if it is a list of names of your trustees, this is information that is already publicly available. You don't need to have the highest level of encryption um, software on that particular list. But if you've got very vulnerable beneficiaries with um, specific health needs and you've got details of that, that information needs to be much more secure than your list of trustees, for example. So making sure that it's secure and making sure it's secure wherever it is. So as I said, if it's um, on laptops, if it's in the cloud, um, if it is in a, um, the same as if it's in paper form and it's in a filing cabinet in an office, um, making sure that filing cabinet is locked. Now, for somebody of my age, um, talking to you about locked filing cabinets makes much more sense than talking to you about firewalls and encryptions, because these are things that, um, are very technical and I don't necessarily understand what they are, but I do know that you need to have them. Um, but, the, but firewalls and encryption are essentially locking the filing cabinet and making sure that the key isn't still in there. Um, because I've seen that so many times when I used to go and do data audits and you'd go into, it's usually the HR office to be fair, um, and oh yes, all our, all our personnel files are in this, this locked box. I said yes, but the, the key's in the lock. So I could come in and unlock it. You need to make sure you put the key somewhere. You need to make sure you lock the door of the office when you're not in there, all of those things. And that's essentially what the, um, you need to apply that to your digital information in the same way that you would your paper information. Um, last but one, staff training, awareness and buy-in. I've already talked about that a little bit in terms of the culture. So making sure that your staff know and your volunteers, everybody who's dealing with personal data knows what it is they need to do and they're aware of it. They don't necessarily need to be aware of 
the specifics of Article 4 of the UK GDPR, they need to be aware of how that impacts them, so what they actually need to be doing. And then finally, registration with the Information Commissioner's Office if it's appropriate. So if you are required to register, then you should um, register and pay the fee. Um, I think for charities, it's £35. It was last time I looked, it might have gone up. Um, and it's a yearly thing and then you go on the register. If you're not required to register, you can voluntarily register. I'm, my view is that there's no real benefit to that. Um, there are some benefits in terms of um, demonstrating transparency because you've registered when you don't have to, but to be honest, I don't think many individuals are actually that concerned about it. Um, I certainly don't know of anyone I go on the ICO website and check people registered, but that's usually because I'm looking at a due diligence exercise. So it's one of the questions um, I wouldn't otherwise necessarily check. So um, I don't think it's actually a, it's not really a sign of compliance because whether or not you registered doesn't affect whether or not the law applies. The law applies whether or not you're registered with the ICO. So, it doesn't really have any benefits, but it is an option if you um, if you wanted to voluntarily register. Right, photographs and videos, um, and I'll just explain um, the photograph for a second. So this is my daughter. Uh, a few years ago, we are on um, a dinosaur ride at Disneyland because I love dinosaurs. Uh, you can see from that she is less keen on dinosaurs, um, and the reason I use this photograph in this context. Um, mainly because I think it's funny, but also it, it makes a very good point. I love this photograph and I love it because you can see exactly what she is thinking on her face. And I love that. And I think it's, I do think it's a funny um, face that she's, she's making. And I think it's brilliant. Um, she hates it um, and thinks it's an awful photograph. She doesn't like her face. She can, she's 13 now, so she complains about the way her hair looks or whatever. Um, and it reminds her of a time when she was actually quite frightened, so she doesn't, doesn't like it. I have, however, got her permission to share this with you um, when I do these talks, because I said, it's a classic example of um, a photograph that I think is nice, but that she wouldn't necessarily want shared. Um, so when you are using photographs and images, it's always worth thinking about that. You might think it's a great photograph, but actually you need to take account of the individual's wishes. Um, but I'll, I'm now going to talk you through how you do that and and because the, the context in which you do that is quite important from a legal point of view. So using photographs and videos and images, again, absolutely fine. You can use, um, there is no bar on using images um, or photographs, videos, whatever it is, um, anywhere you want to. So on your website, social media, newsletters, however you want to use them. The GDPR, the UK GDPR does not prevent you from doing that. There are just steps that you have to go through in order to do it. Um, so the first, question I would ask or the first set of questions are what images do you want to use, where do you want to use them and why. Um, usually it's promotional um, but it may be informational because you may want to give um, beneficiaries information about the people that they might be speaking with if they're coming to your charity um, but whatever the reason is as long as you can point out say this is what this is what we want to use, this is where we're going to use it and this is why and again the why then feeds into your legal basis. So um, there may be examples where actually the use of photographs um, is really important. And an example of that um, that might be relevant to some of you listening in schools, um, if you have children or pupils with allergies, um, it can be really important to be able to identify those children quickly. And the quickest way to do that is for the catering staff or the relevant teacher on the trip or whoever it is to have a photograph, particularly if they're not familiar with the class. So they know this is the individual who should not have um, nuts or milk or whatever it happens to be. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a perfectly legitimate use of images. And your legal basis there um, would pro potentially be um, vital interests. Um, because you need to be able to use um, that information to save them. Um, somebody's asked about photographs on social media. Um, it's no different to, so you, um, when I'm talking about the use of images, I'm talking about using it wherever you want. So when I say 
where are you going to use it? That's what I mean. So are you going to use it on social media? Are you going to use it on, um, on newsletters? Are you going to use it on your website? Where are you using, where are you putting these images? And then why? So usually if it's social media, it's promotional and that's absolutely fine. But again, you, so that's the reason that then feeds into your legal basis. Now, the legal basis bit is the is the crux of this and is really, really important. And I can't stress this enough um, in order to avoid problems down the line. We recommend that in most certainly in all of the cases that I've dealt with where I've been asked, can I use a photograph? The legal basis, I would say, if it's not vital interests or it's not some sort of um, public task in the public interest, or it's not a contractual requirement, I can't think of one, but it might be a contractual requirement with an employee that you use a photograph or something. Um, the legal basis would be, I recommend, is legitimate interests. And the reason I say that and not consent is because consent causes all manner of difficulties because your consent has to be um, freely given. Um, so it has to be in a um, in a way that um, the individual has a genuine choice. Um, it has to be withdrawable. Um, and that's another reason why I don't like consent because if you ask an individual if they consent to using uh, to you using their photograph and you use consent as your legal basis under the UK GDPR. If they then withdraw their consent, you have to take that photograph down or that video down and you have to remove it and you have to take steps to take it down from everywhere that it's been published. And that's actually almost impossible when it comes to social media and retweets and reshares and liking and all of those things. Um, so actually, is the consent actually withdrawable? Um, arguably not, so you can't rely on consent anyway. Um, so consent also has to be um, informed. So that means that at the point at which you are using or you're taking the photograph and you're telling the individual and you're asking them for consent, you need to know at that point exactly where you want to use that photograph and how you're going to use it so that they consent to all those uses. Um, so you may say, can I use it on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter? And then in two years time, there's a brand new social media platform that suddenly everybody's on and you want to use the photographs there, but you can't because they haven't given you consent for that. So you'd have to go back for consent, but you can't go back for consent because you don't know where they are now because it was a volunteer and they've left and they've moved on, etc. Um, so consent really restricts you in what you can do with um, with those photographs and images. If you use legitimate interests, um, that means that you need to take account of the wishes of the individual. So we do recommend, as I've um, pointed out earlier, that you speak to individuals, explain about what you're going to do with the image and how you're going to use it and make sure that they're happy with that. But you don't go as far as getting their consent. And that means that you can still use the image even if they say no. Now, there are some circumstances where you wouldn't do that. So if you are taking promotional um, pictures for your website and a particular person says, actually, I really don't like having my photograph taken and I don't want it up there. You don't necessarily want to upset them or antagonize them by using that image so you don't use it. But there might be circumstances where actually the objections are just not valid and you need to use the photograph because you need to promote your next event or whatever it happens to be. Um, and you want that photograph to be, it's really important that photograph be used and the purposes for which you're using it outweigh those objections. And if you're using legitimate interests, you can carry out that analysis and still use the photograph. As I said, in most cases, you probably wouldn't, but there are times when you will want to. Um, so we say rely on legitimate interest, but what does that mean in practice? In practice, that means your privacy notice must say that you are using legitimate interests for photographs and images. Um, so you could, because you have to tell people about it. Um, it means that you need to be very careful if you are using consent forms as to how they are worded. Because if you start to talk about consent, you raise an expectation with the individual that they have given consent. And that means that they think that they can then withdraw that consent. And if they can't, um, that then causes you problems. 
Um, it's also important because certain of the rights that individuals have under um, data protection law are only apply where the legal basis is certain things. Um, so where the legal basis is legitimate interest or where it's consent. So it's really important that you know which legal basis that you're relying on. So if we go back to basics, um, if you want to use a photograph or a video or an image of someone in any context at all, um, every time you use that image, um, it has to be fair, transparent, and you must have a lawful basis. So that's what the law says, that's what the UK GDPR says. Fairness looks at whether something is within the reasonable expectations of individuals. I think it's reasonable that um, we all know that people will use photographs in um, promotional material on social media. It's reasonable to accept, expect that. You can set that expectation as well. If you tell people we are taking photographs and we are going to be using this um, in promotional materials. I had to have my photograph taken twice. In fact, I hate having my photo taken um, to put on our website. I was told, before it happened, this is the purpose of this. Uh, we're taking a photograph, putting it on the website, et cetera. So I know what's going to happen. So that is fair. Transparency is about whether you have mentioned this in your privacy notice and whether you've set out the relevant information. So it's really important that it's in there. And then you choose your lawful basis, your legal basis. And as I've said, um, my preference um, is go for legitimate interests where you can. Um, if it's between consent and, and um, legitimate interests go for the legitimate interests um, because that gives you greater flexibility going forwards. So what's new? So I mentioned the um, data reform bill. I'm conscious of time so um, and because these are not law yet and we don't know what will happen when they go through parliament and there's all sorts of issues around if we change the UK GDPR too much we won't have an adequacy decision and it means that people in Europe won't be able to transfer data to us and there's all sorts of issues around that so um, I'm not uh, I'm not convinced that a lot of this will get through let's put it that way but we'll have to wait and see but the key things for you to sort of just be vaguely aware of in the back of your mind in case they come to be um, the main purpose of the data reform bill is apparently a reduction in red tape um, is my view on that basically, but that's, that's what it says. Um, one of the things that they are thinking about, which I do think would be actually really, really helpful and I really hope does go through, um, is that um, they are thinking about extending the um, soft opt-in under PECA, the marketing regulations um, to charities. So that would mean that you wouldn't have to get consent to send out um, direct marketing emails, so all of your fundraising emails, etc., you wouldn't need consent for. You could rely on um, the fact that you've you have a relationship with an individual and you've um, sent them similar information. So that would be brilliant if that goes through. Um, the uh, the government are really keen on making um, data available for research. I work with a lot of universities who do research and actually some charities that do research. And I am very keen on this as well. Um, I do think it's really important that um, genuine you know, research projects can use the data that's out there and is available and they're hoping to make that easier. It is, it's possible at the moment, but I know having worked through the various gateways that it's not always simple um, and it could be more streamlined and effective so I'm hoping that will be um, that will be one that they do take on um, and also uh, reform of subject access uh, there's some talk about doing something um, to um, to make it easier for you to not have to deal with essentially vexatious requests um, so those are the ones that and, and there is already the manifestly unfounded or unreasonable um, exemption, um, but actually that's quite difficult to apply. So I think they're looking at um, extending that hopefully. So that would be really good because it would mean that it would cut out some of those um, requests that you know are just um, intended to, to cause disruption and actually are not, um, no one's actually interested in the information that's being asked for.
The other thing to just be aware of is that um, I talked earlier a little bit about international transfers of data. So if you are transferring information outside of the UK, um, we used to have standard contractual clauses that you could use. You can still use the EU clauses, but they are being phased out. And we now have UK clauses. The, they're known as the IDTA, the International Data Transfer Agreement. I should have put the word data in there, shouldn't I? So as you can see what the acronym is. But um, I haven't looked at these in any detail, but they're broadly the same as the European um, versions. Uh, so I don't, there's no, the benefit of using them is that they are um, future proof. Um, so there will come a point when standard contractual clauses you won't be able to use and you'll have to use the, um, the UK version. Um, but so that's the benefit of using them really um, in terms of complexity, etc. They are what they are. You have to use them as they are. So there's no real sort of um, benefit or detriment to using either of them. Um, brilliant. Um, next slide, please. Um, so very quickly, because I want to get to the questions, um, I did mention earlier talking about policies um, and training, etc. We do have some data protection e-learning available for charities. Um, it's quick and easy to set up. You can track that staff have read and understood their responsibilities. And the key bit, of course, for the accountability is the evidence that staff have listened to the training. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. I think there's a poll. Um, if you're interested, um, please do click yes. Um, or if you're not interested, please do click no, that's absolutely fine. And while you're doing that, I'm just gonna have a very quick look at the questions um, in case there's anything I need to um, check the answer to. Okay, I will go, um, I'll go through the chat ones first. Um, so how long should we keep staff information after a member of staff has left? and what about job applicants? Um, it's up to you. And there's a certain length of time that you have to keep um, certain records for tax, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that's six years. Um, but, and the job applicants, the standard that I've seen is six months, um, but, in, but under GDPR or UK GDPR, there's no set period. Um, so data protection law doesn't actually say how long you should keep records for specifically. All data protection law says is you must keep them for as long as you need them and then destroy them. Um, so it depends how long you need it. Um, the, um, there are, as I said, but there are other legal regimes that will apply. Um, so tax is a good example. Um, lots of organisations use six or 12 years because that's limitation periods for various claims. So that can be quite helpful. Um, but essentially, as long as you can justify the length of time that you want to keep the information for, you can keep it for that length of time. Um, thanks for the comment about that jigsaw. Um, the keeping of hard copy archives. Um, how can I decide what old records to keep for future generations and what should be discarded? Um, that's not really, that's not a data protection question. Um, that's a question for you and what you think is appropriate. Um, you can keep everything if you think that um, it will be of use to future generations or will be of interest. Um, if you don't, then you can discard it after whatever period of time. So. Um, it's completely up to you. And in terms of storage, as long as you're storing it in a way that is um, secure, again, that's absolutely fine. Um, so uh, completely up to you. Um, photographs of people on Facebook and other social media. Hopefully I, I dealt with that, but do add another question if I didn't. Um, as a grant maker, we want to add photos to our website provided by the charities we support. Um, the charities will have had to get their own permission to use as photographs. Um, yes, so I, sorry, I answered the question, but I haven't asked it. I assume we ought to also get official permission from the charity we have funded. I would put that on the charity. Um, I would say, uh, put, have something in writing to say that, um, I don't know if you have some sort of grant agreement with them, but something to say, um, we will use photographs on our um, website. Um, please let us know um, if this can't happen, because obviously you do have to be careful around safeguarding, particularly photographs of children. Um, but yeah, I would leave that to the charity and make sure that, and put it on them to notify 
um, the individuals that this is going to happen um, so that they can then contact you if there's if there's any kind of issue. But yeah, you can you can rely. It's better to have it in writing, but you could rely on the other charity getting whatever permissions they think they need. Um, what about displays of people's faces on church or school notice boards where you don't know who may see it? That's again, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, nobody knows who's going to walk past or who see the photograph. As long as you've told people where it's going to be, um, then they can make their own decision about whether they're happy for that. Um, and again, if it's necessary or important that you do it, then um, think about whether you're using legitimate interest. But that's about your transparency piece and how you talk to people about where their information is going to be. Um, for photos, if putting in your privacy notice, do you need to give people the chance of opting out of having uh, their photos used for promotional purposes, etc.? This is where it gets, um, the legal position is easy, but this is where you, if you start to do that, you start to muddy the waters. So um, you can give people the chance to opt out. I wouldn't use it in those terms. I would say, personally, um, we are we will use photographs for these purposes um this is um our legal basis is legitimate interests um please contact this person um if you have an issue um and so that way and and also at the point at which you're taking photographs um if you're taking them yourself then you can speak to people and ask them if they're happy with it um but you need to be quite wary about the language you're using because if you start to talk about opt out, opt in, opt out consent, then people start to think that you're relying on consent and that's where, um, where things can get more difficult. Um, where does copyright come in with images used on other sites to use on ours or social media? Um, that's not a question I can answer, unfortunately, because I don't specialise in copyright or um, in such property. So that's something that I would have to ask our um, commercial team. Um, if a person is a public figure and doesn't wish to sign our consent form, can we put his stuff up on our website and other platforms? Um, if you have... Um, uh, oh, so sorry, I think, um, so you're asking, does the fact that they're a public figure make a difference? No, it doesn't, unfortunately. Um, if you've asked someone for consent and they've refused consent, even if their material is available elsewhere, um, you have said essentially that you're not going to use it. So you've sort of um, prevented yourself from, from doing that. Um, the, when, the GDPR came in back in 2016-18, um, um, it was very clear that um, just because something is publicly available doesn't mean that it's um, available to all. So if I have put something on Facebook, that doesn't mean that someone else can take it and use it. I've put it on Facebook for putting it on Facebook's sake, not for somebody else to take it. So um, I would be quite wary, wary of that. Um, if someone's given their permission for their information photographs to be used and then dies, can we continue to use? Um, yes, uh, the UK GDPR stops applying at the point where somebody um, dies, so you don't have to, um, it doesn't apply essentially, so those use of photographs are fine. Um, I suppose you might want to contact the family to make sure that they're happy, um, but there would be no legal requirement to do that. Um, can I use a picture of a child that's found on the web? Um, I would be wary of doing that because you don't know what, um, this is the issue about, um, you don't know what permissions or what, um, what happened at the point at which that photograph of that child was taken. So you don't know what the child's expectations are in terms of the use of that photograph. Um, so I wouldn't use images that I'd found on the web. There are stock photographs that you can use. Some are free and some you can pay for. Those are fine because they've got all the bits in place, but, and there might also be copyright issues there. So I would be quite wary of that. Um, can we share CCTV images with other retail outfits? Or landlords of flats above shops? Uh, yes, um, 
provided um again you, as with any use of any kind of image is it fair is it transparent and do you have a legal basis so is it fair um will depend on the the reason you're sharing it i'm assuming because there's been an incident um if there's been an incident then yes that's um that's fine um you can share those um that would be fair because people would expect that if there is CCTV in an area where they do something they shouldn't have done that that image will be shared. Um, is it transparent? So do you have something in your privacy notice somewhere about um, sharing of CCTV images? Um, and what would the lawful basis be? Um, if it's to prevent crime, that's potentially a public task in the public interest. Otherwise, it's probably just of interest. So yeah, in theory, that's absolutely fine. Um, Brilliant. I'll just go to the Q&A. Uh, so do we always need employees to sign consent forms for photography at events? Nope. Um, you do if you have told them that you rely on consent. Um, and that's how you um, and the consent. Um, you haven't got a, a consent to always use photographs at events. Um, if you're not relying on consent and you're relying on just interest, then no, you don't need to. Um, is there a possibility of gaining consent where the statement at the time of collection states that whilst they can withdraw consent later and you will do your best to remove images, but that if the images have been shared, as has been stated, it may not be possible and that a legitimate interest to continue to use it would then be applied. Um, most schools ask for consent rather than use legitimate interest. Um, yes, that's that's one, that's a way of attempting to mitigate the risk there but the risk still applies that because you can't stop people sharing that people can't um, necessarily uh, withdraw their consent effectively um, although that's not actually your fault that is the fault of the platforms that do that to be fair so i don't think that you would necessarily be criticized for that um, but it's why i think it's easier to lose, use legitimate interests um, I am aware um, that lots of schools ask for consent. I'm also aware that lots of organisations ask for consent in a way that is not compliant um, and in a way that doesn't work, including my daughter's school, um, which doesn't have a great, um, it's all fine, um, but I do think, and it, it's fine as long as there's no problem, but as soon as somebody objects, if your systems aren't right, um, then it just causes all manner of, of issues. So um, it's it's really useful to get these things right before there's a problem um, and to give you the most sort of flexibility and, and ability to, to move. So I'm not saying um, if you want to use consent, absolutely use consent, that's absolutely fine. It's a perfectly um, legal way of proceeding. Um, but what I'm saying is my advice is if you can use legitimate interests, it just makes your life much easier going forwards. Um, uh, I've answered the question about images um, from CCTV. Um, can you refuse um, a subject access request if it would affect the rights of another subject who may be vulnerable and possibly put in danger? Um, that's really difficult for me to answer without knowing the specifics actually of the, sorry, it's one of those questions. It depends <laughs> um, on, the, um, on what's been asked for and what the information is. Um, it's unlikely, I think, that you would be able to refuse um, an entire subject access request because the whole, uh, it depends what, again, it depends what they've asked for. If somebody's asked for everything you hold, I think it's unlikely that everything you hold about them will put someone in danger, someone else in danger because their name is their personal data and just telling them that you hold their name is someone else in danger. Um, but there is an exemption for information that would also identify a third party where you um, where you don't have that person's consent or it would not be reasonable in the circumstances to release it. Now, obviously, if releasing the information would identify that person and would put them in danger, it would not be reasonable. So it might be possible to withhold some of that, that information. Um, to play, displaying recipient lists in emails, um, is this, um, I presume you're asking, is that um, okay? Um, no, uh, <laughs> not unless everybody knows that that's what's going to happen. Uh, actually, I've said no and I've laughed. Um, when it depends on the, again, it depends, sorry, that's stock uh, lawyer answer. Um, if it's an email to um, 
your trustees and the trustees all know each other's email address and they know the email is going to all of the trustees, that's fine. Um, if you're sending an email out to a group of beneficiaries who don't necessarily know each other and won't necessarily have each other's contact details, then no, you shouldn't. Um, you should put that in the BCC um, field. Um, might be able to get to these last two questions in the last two minutes. Um, once an individual grant has been awarded, how long after this would you keep hold of the applicant details? Um, we have cases where the same applicant will apply again the following year. Applicants can only apply three times within five years. Would you say we can delete after five years? Yeah, that sounds reasonable to me. Um, if you're happy that after that three year period, that five year period, sorry, they can do another three applications, then that's fine. If you wanted to make sure that um, you, so you could delete it after five years from the first application or five years from their last application. That would seem to be the, the um, I don't know how that works actually. I can't do the maths in my head, off the top of my head, sorry. But yeah, five years, um, whether you do it from the first application or the last, that all sounds completely reasonable. You could keep it for a little bit afterwards, just in case. Um, with these types of situations, uh, you, it's what you're trying to prevent is um, is fraud essentially, and people applying, uh, continue you know, making multiple applications when actually uh, they shouldn't be. Um, so there are some cases where that's fine, and others where it's not. So if it's one of those where that's not appropriate, then yeah, absolutely, you can keep it for as long as you need it to to go through that process. Um, I have a question about requests for CCTV um, footage, especially of external cameras. Um, People contact us sometimes for access to footage following car accidents or incidents. Um, we review the footage, see if anything is useful, but what should our approach be um, for these cases? Um, it's absolutely fine, as I mentioned before, to, uh, to provide CCTV footage for that purpose. Um, you just need to be clear I appreciate that the person on the CCTV footage may not have seen your privacy notice, but if you can put a notice on your website um, where it says in there something about CCTV footage may be shared with third parties um, where relevant, um, you just need to go through that process of is it fair, is it transparent, and um, do I have a legal basis? So if you can demonstrate that it's fair and it's transparent and you can identify a legal basis, then you can share that information. Um, the follow up to the subject access request question. Um, the individual wants a copy of a letter sent by a third party who does not want to be identified and the content of the letter would make it easy to identify the sender, removing parts of the email would make it unreasonable. Then absolutely yes, you do not have to um, release that letter. You can withhold the whole thing in full um, because it identifies the sender, it's their personal data as well as the data of the requester so it, you're essentially then balancing the rights between the two and if you if it's not appropriate in the circumstances it sounds like this is one of those clear cases where it's not appropriate in circumstances to release their identity then that's absolutely fine.